As I cross the San Pedro River, it reminds me of where I grew up. We had trees like that where I lived, and we used to take a picnic lunch and spend the day in the shade wading or fishing. Kids nowadays don't know what that is all about. We used to be out all day long when I was young. We had a secret place that only we knew about. It wasn't hard to find a place to go, and nobody seemed to mind too much if you went across their property. There weren't as many fences, and you could walk or ride your bike, and no one cared. It's getting harder and harder to find a place where you can go and have fun for free, or just walk around and think about things. When I went to school, the teachers would take us out on field trips. We had ponds where we could see turtles and frogs and bugs. We caught things with nets, and we learned about how they all lived together in the water. Sometimes, even as an adult, when I had the time, I would go down to the river and think about what life was like at an earlier time. In my mind, I imagined I could hear the sounds from another time rise up from the past. I remember one winter when it actually snowed down on the river. I was headed into work, but as I crossed the river, I looked out at the blanket of white, and I knew I just had to take the day off and wander along the banks. Once when it had rained hard overnight, the next morning, as I was driving down out of the mountains, I saw the most wonderful formations of clouds and fog. It seemed as if I was in a place I had never been before. Sometimes I look out across the San Pedro River, and I try to imagine what it was like for the first groups of people who came here. There was this great desert all around them. How did people survive back then? Why would anyone have ever wanted to live here? Thirteen thousand years ago, as the snows from the last ice age began to retreat from the mountains surrounding the San Pedro River Valley, an ancient culture of hunter-gatherers known as the Clovis people arrived taking advantage of the valley's plentiful wildlife and substantial vegetation. Watercourses like the San Pedro River provided essential resources for these people and the prehistoric animals that lived here at that time. As the climate gradually warmed and became more arid, new groups of nomadic people moved across the great deserts and settled where the flowing water of the San Pedro River made life possible. It was the San Pedro River that enabled a group referred to as the Cochise culture to develop the early forms of agriculture necessary for them to prosper and establish the first villages. The San Pedro River Valley was also a Native American trade route connecting the great Mexican and Central American cultures of the South to the great Northern Native cultures of Arizona. Padre Eusebio Quino, who brought Catholicism, cattle, horses, apples, and wheat to this region, followed these same trade routes 
to reach villages of the Sabaipuri people along the San Pedro River in 1698. Later, the Spanish built a fort named Presidio Santa Cruz de Terranate on a bluff overlooking the river below. In the 1800s, this area was home to early gold and silver mines that required the river water to produce the steam to operate stamp mills and to separate the metals in the milling process. Early towns such as Tombstone and Charleston were supported by railroads that connected the San Pedro River Valley to Mexican ports on the Sea of Cortez, U.S. ports on the West Coast, and ports on the Mississippi River. Cattle ranches such as the Little Boquias and Mosin ranches provided much of the food needs of the growing mining settlements. Cattle ranches were established here because of the richer grasslands and the marshes along the river. Finally, Camp Huachuca was established to protect these flourishing economic interests as they struggled against fierce Apache raids in the late 1800s. This one river in the middle of a great desert has been continuously inhabited since the last ice age. It was our San Pedro River and the rich habitat that it supports that attracted all these people, from the first prehistoric hunting and gathering cultures to the U.S. soldiers that established Fort Huachuca in 1877. Even the towns of Bisbee, Tombstone, and Sierra Vista can trace their beginnings to this river. Today, bird watchers and other nature enthusiasts come here from all over North America, Europe, and Asia, specifically because this part of Arizona attracts so many birds. Here you are in room number two. These tourists annually add an additional 350 to 590 jobs and 17 to 28 million dollars to our local economy. This desert river is a critical migration route for not only birds, but also mammals, small species of fish, many reptiles, and numerous amphibians. This one green wet area in the middle of the desert has allowed some of the most fascinating creatures from the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico to reach our valley. The Coati, the Sonoran Opossum, the ocelot, the jaguar, are just a few of the creatures that barely extend their ranges across the southern border of the United States. The San Pedro Riparia National Conservation Area, known as the Sprinca, was one of the first two national conservation areas in our country. The word riparian refers to a natural area that occurs next to water. National conservation areas are protected lands in the western United States that have exceptional scientific, educational, cultural, historical, ecological, and recreational resources. These lands are recommended for protection and then approved by the United States Congress. The Bureau of Land Management is then required to protect the national conservation areas for public use and preserve them for future generations. To drink water from here? I found it the idea was to secure these special areas while they are still available to be obtained. As a result, these wonderful resources are now accessible to everyone who wishes to experience our great western outdoors. Contained in the Sprinka are resources that appeal to nearly everyone. The legislation that created the Sprinka helps to preserve the character of the Old West that so many people identify with the state of Arizona. Today, the Sprinka is an irreplaceable educational resource for local school districts, as well as colleges, universities, and working and retired people. 
Kindergarten through high school groups use this diverse habitat as the best place to learn about the relationships of natural systems and the importance of our corridor of life and the migratory patterns of birds and other animals in this hemisphere. Archaeologists are uncovering fascinating information about early explorers and settlers and native populations. Biologists are discovering evidence of animal species thought to no longer exist in this part of the world. The important thing for many people, however, is the connection the river helps them have with an earlier place in time, when landscapes were unbroken and environments were healthy and clean. A place where people can go to sort out their thoughts and behold the beauty of the world that was first given to us. The work to establish and protect the Sprinka began as a local grassroots initiative that was then supported by state and federal representatives. When the conservation area was established, boundaries were secured, buildings were restored, facilities were enhanced, and management policies were developed. The one major thing that could not be secured, however, was the river itself. Rivers in the state of Arizona that once were perennial have been drying up over the last 100 years. These maps of Arizona show that rivers that once flowed all year when Arizona was made a state now only flow for a portion of the year or not at all. Let's take a closer look at how the San Pedro River has fared over the same time period. As we can see, the San Pedro, one of the few remaining perennial rivers in the state, barely flows for a portion of its original length. Other major rivers in the state are even worse off than the San Pedro. The Bill Williams River now is no longer considered perennial. This portion of the Salt River is no longer considered perennial, and the Gila River no longer is considered perennial. Our San Pedro River, unfortunately, is part of that drying trend in the state. Measurements of the Charleston Gauge operated by the United States Geological Survey for the last 99 years show that the San Pedro River flow is one half of its early 20th century flow. A graph of the data shows how the river is steadily declining. One of the most significant threats to the San Pedro River is our use of groundwater. Excessive use of groundwater drained the Santa Cruz River, a very similar river that parallels the San Pedro River 60 miles to the west. Just like many other problems, no single cause is responsible for this. However, one of the major causes appears to be the amount of groundwater pumping from local communities that compete with the river for water. Here we see a time sequence showing how the number of groundwater wells in the upper San Pedro watershed has increased over time. Since 1990, there has been a tremendous increase in the number of wells. This dramatic increase is robbing our aquifer of its ability to supply water to the river. The legislation creating the Sprinka states that a base flow must be maintained in the San Pedro River. Luckily, we have the ability to change our water use practices that we know compete with the river for water. The continued health of the river is the concern of many different groups and individuals. There are also many reasons for this concern, but everyone involved agrees that we need to reverse the trends that are decreasing the flow and we need to permanently stabilize or conserve the river as the core of the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. As wasteful practices are identified and residents are educated, progress can be made to turn off the faucet where not needed. Many times, water conservation is simply a matter of changing old habits that don't really serve us anymore and have a negative impact on the river. Maintaining the type of grass lawn that is typical of wetter areas of the United States is a good example of this. A local Sierra Vista lawn required nine feet of water to make it look healthy and lush over a one-year period. This six-foot young man points to a line nine feet up to represent just how much water that is. On the other hand, xeriscapes or low-water landscaping using native plants, passive water collection, mulch, and gravel may use no groundwater at all. 
Solutions are also emerging that can use the runoff from rainstorms to recharge the underground water that is our aquifer. This can help offset the negative effects of groundwater pumping. As an example, Fort Huachuca has reduced its water use by 60% in the last 20 years. As Senator John McCain said when proposing the legislation, The establishment of the Sprinka will assure that future generations of Americans will be able to utilize the recreational, wildlife, educational, and scientific benefits this region has to offer. This area deserves special designation, and it is my hope that we can act on this legislation as quickly as possible. We now need to continue the grassroots movement that our representatives supported and enacted in the 1980s. As President Teddy Roosevelt said, Here is your country. Cherish these natural wonders. Cherish the natural resources. Cherish the history and romance as a sacred heritage for your children and your children's children. Do not let selfish men or greedy interests skin your country of its beauty, its riches, or its romance. The San Pedro River is our heritage and our history. This is our water and this is our land. Let's finish the work we started and protect the river that brought mankind here. The river was here before the first humans arrived. Are we the generation that will cause its death? Or will we be able to maintain a flowing river for our children and our children's children.